the last few days. I don't know uh, when you get ready to preach to preachers, what in the world do you preach? Right. <laughs> About everything applies. I heard Brother Kesey preaching yesterday, um, and it was a blessing to my heart. He was uh, talking about his first point, maybe, I think, in that message was uh, obey. And uh, this scripture here this morning will uh, probably remind us again to obey. Amen. The book of Deuteronomy is, uh, uh, I, I'm not going to try to school y'all. Uh, I would be the least of uh, uh, among all of us here to try to tell you anything about this Bible, probably. But the book of Deuteronomy, we understand, uh, happens, uh, covers a period of about uh, 40 years in all the things it tells, but it takes place in a a period of about 40 days, if I'm not mistaken. In the first chapter here in the book of Deuteronomy, it says that there, uh, it's the 11th day, I believe it is. It says it's, uh, uh, it came to pass in the third verse, in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month. And then when you get over into the book of Joshua, uh, you'll find out that it's about 70 days later when they crossed over the River Jordan and they had mourned for Moses after his death for about 30 days. So what took place in the book of Deuteronomy leaves you about 70, I mean 40 days. You take 30 from 70. And so you pray for me in just a few minutes. I want to try to settle down here and just give you a few thoughts. And, um, I think... Uh, sometimes we're talking about, uh, Brother Andrew's talking about being excited. Uh, excited. Excitement comes across in different ways sometimes. Right. Um, I feel excited to be here in the house of the Lord this yeah. morning. I feel excited to, uh, to preach, but I, I, right now my nerves is outweighing the excitement. <laughs> and uh, so I've got to try to get settled down just a little bit. And uh, try to give you these thoughts. Deuteronomy chapter 11. I want to give uh, three verses for text this morning. And then maybe we'll try to draw a few thoughts out of here. Um, beginning in verse number 10. If you want to stand with me uh, while we read these verses this morning. But these uh, verses came to me a few days ago as I was studying. Out, uh, actually out over in the uh, uh, book of Mark. And uh, I, I came running some references, came across this, and the Lord just dealt with my heart with it almost ever since. When I, You preachers know what I mean. When you wake up in the middle of the night and that verse is on your mind, and when you wake up in the morning it's on your mind, and when you go to bed at night it's on your mind. And so I've been just trying to sort through this thing. And uh, verse number 10 says, For the land, whither thou goest in to possess it, is not as the land of Egypt. I'm glad where I'm at is not like where I was. Are you glad for that this morning? Where you were at is not like where you were. The land whither thou goest in possess it, it's not as the land of Egypt from whence he came out. I'm glad to be out of there. Where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. And I got to tell you, it took me a few days of chewing around on that to really understand maybe what he's trying to tell me there. But there was nothing easy down in Egypt. There was nothing easy. There was no water in Egypt, and if anything was going to grow, you were going to have to work for the water. You're going to have to carry water. He said, verse number 11, but the land, whether you go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys. Yeah, Amen. It's a land of hills and valleys. There's a lot of ups and downs. Sure, sure. And it drinketh water of the rain of heaven. I'm glad I'm somewhere today where I can get a drink from the water of heaven. I'm no longer having to carry water, but I'm receiving water. Verse number 
12 says, A land which the Lord thy God careth for. For the eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it. From the beginning of the year, even unto the end of the year. Hallelujah. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for this time that we have here. I pray, Lord, that you'd help me just for a few minutes. And, uh, Lord, I pray that you'd open our hearts and help us to receive these truths today. Uh, there wouldn't be anything that I could say that would help anybody. But, Lord, if you would come and the Holy Spirit would deliver these words, I believe it could be a help to all of us. And I just pray, Father, for uh, your will to be done in this meeting. In Jesus' name, and amen. amen. The book of Deuteronomy is a... Uh, a lot of times we just think of it as a retelling of the law, but there's a lot of things here that uh, that are told in the book of Deuteronomy that don't necessarily get told in the book of Exodus. There's a lot of things that uh, that are going on. There's a there's this trip journey. You find out in chapter number one that they, it was actually just an 11 day journey, but it was 40 years in the making. Uh, I feel kind of like that sometimes. I'm kind of a slow traveler too. Slow travelers, uh, 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 slow learners, amen. Anybody ever feel like that? I, I've been a slow learner. And I've taken a long time sometimes to get where I'm going. Just see, it would be a short distance. But it seemed like the Lord took me a long way around. So 40 years to make an 11-day journey. And in the book of Deuteronomy, they're looking over some of the lessons that were learned in the book of Exodus. They were living it in the book of Exodus and they were going through it, all the things that God did and God showed them and how He led them and all the provisions that He made for them. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, they get recounted. A lot of those things do. And so they're looking over those and drawing some lessons from it. Right. I'm glad that I think Brother uh, Stroud mentioned last night about if uh, any of those Bible prophecy teachers, those uh, professors that had any God on them, he said, look like they could have told us about what was going to happen here with COVID-19. <laughs> but at least we've got the last 18 months, we can look back over it and maybe we can learn some lessons. Yeah. Right. There's been a lot of times that there's been divisions that's come up. There's been people who've got different opinions about this and that. It seems like that everybody's opinion is the most important opinion to them. Amen. And so it's hard to navigate these days, but we can look over what's happened in the past and learn some lessons. I'm glad that we can reread the Word of God and we can learn from some lessons that we don't necessarily have to live through ourselves if we just pay attention to what's going on. So the book of Deuteronomy, it reviews the past. It gives us a little bit of prophecy of the future. In the book of Deuteronomy, uh, one of the things, one of the words that really sticks out to you as you read through here is the word land. I think about a hundred times the land is mentioned. And then I think that you'll find given is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy about 75 times given. You know, when you talk about God giving something, it's divine mercy and grace that we're talking about. We're not talking about that he just gives us something. I, I, I want to tell you, I've got some grandchildren. I've got seven of them. And two of them uh, live pretty close to us. and They attend church with us and all that kind of stuff. And so they, those two boys, I see them all the time. And I cannot think of one thing that I wouldn't give them. And I just give it because I want to. I don't have to have a reason to give it. Right. Sunday evening before we left, my wife said we need to go down and see them a little bit. We stopped by and got some ice cream, and we pulled up in the driveway. They came out to meet us there. And Eli, the oldest one, he's five, and he liked that ice cream, but he said to the side, he said, I ain't got time to eat it right now. Papa, he said, I'm busy. I got to go to work. Okay. It don't matter if it melts and runs all over the place. It's just I wanted him to have it. You know, God just gives us stuff because He wants us to have it. God don't have to have a reason to do anything. I pulled up the driveway down there one day and Eli said, Papa, what are you doing here today? And I said, I just wanted to see you, buddy. And that's all there is to it. When you think about giving in the 
book of Deuteronomy is because of divine grace. Uh, another word, two words together that's in the book of Deuteronomy a lot is this day. There's a lot of emphasis put on this day. Yeah. You know, we think uh, about tomorrow a lot of times. We worry about tomorrow, but this day is the one that counts. Yeah. And this is the day that we're going to have to take care of right now. This, this day. Yeah. This day. And then the word possesses. Almost 70 times the word possesses in this chapter or in this book. Possess. So we've got some things that God has given us. He wants us to possess them. And uh, I, I believe really that we should uh, consider a little bit more. It's about obedience. Now I'm not talking about, I'm not going to try to preach obedience as salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith. Amen. Right. Salvation is by grace through faith. But uh, obedience, obedience doesn't necessarily... Uh, add to your salvation, but I'll tell you, you can't hardly enjoy your salvation without obedience. That's right. That's right. That's right. told us that yesterday. You can't enjoy your salvation without obedience. And I want to tell you something else you can't have without obedience is a good testimony. Right. Had a man uh, the other day, he sat down with me. I was in the restaurant eating, and he sat down there just I was about by myself, and he said, you mind if I sit down and I don't know why I got started talking about this, but in a few minutes, you know, he said, you know, a man won't go to hell if he drinks a beer every now and then. I said, nobody ain't going to have no good testimony either. That's right. yes. uh, and he started wanting to try to justify, I don't know why he even said that. Well, that wasn't part of the conversation. I don't know why he said that. Mm -hmm. But I gave him about two or three minutes of what I thought about it. He remembered he had another point. He had to give us a <laughs> A man ain't going to obey God. He's not going to have a good testimony. There's some reasons why we should obey God. We should obey God because of the law of God. We should just flat out obey because of the law of God. We should be motivated to obey God because of the goodness of God. That's right. There's a, we, we, we didn't, you know, we don't have to have a lot of reasons. Uh, uh, God's been good enough to me in salvation. That I should want to obey God. If uh, the, the kids at church, they've been singing this song lately. And I thought of it last night, I think, while Brother Stroud was preaching. Uh, but it, uh, I am still is. Yeah, I and there's a part of that song that says, if I lost it all, I am still is. Amen. And so if we lost it all, I understand what they're saying when they say that. We'll never lose our salvation. We never lose our home in heaven. We'll never lose. Uh, uh, we'll never lose what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I understand we might lose everything in this world. But you know, if God doesn't do anything else for me anymore, if God never gives me anything else, would He save my souls enough for me to save my days? So we ought to be motivated because of God's goodness toward us. Then, you know, we've got a standard really that we should obey Him. By, and the standard is the Word of God. That's right. Amen. It's the Word of God. The standard. I wanted to read Revelation, or, uh, Romans chapter 12. I just wanted to read it because I figured I'd misquote it. But it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, reasonable service. Reasonable. Yeah. All right. All right. So God help me to be motivated just because the Lord has saved me. Then I've got the standard of His Word. The standard of His Word. You say, well, you know, how many books do y'all have? How many books How many books do you have? You know, some religions have more than one book that they go by. We just got one. Amen? Amen. But I found it to be adequate. I found it to be enough. I found it to be everything that I need. I, I, I don't need any other book. I don't need a supplement. I don't need, a, I don't need anything else. I mean, I appreciate good books, and I think God uses writers, and, and I, I like to read things, but I want to tell you the Word of God is the, is the book of all books. It's the book that we need. It's the book that we live by. It's the standard of our life. And so we obey God because of the Word of God. We have good incentive to be obedient, and that is the faithfulness of God is our incentive. What He's done in the past ought to prove to us what He's going to do in the future. God is not going to fail us now. 
In the book of First Thessalonians, in uh, in First Thessalonians chapter number five and verse number twenty three, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and uh, pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is He that calleth you, who also will do it. Amen. Amen. I believe He's going to do it. Amen. I don't think there's going to be anything that's going to stop Him from doing it. Well, I want to just focus on these three verses just a minute here. We understand about Egypt, the type of sin, and the wilderness being a type of our flesh, and Canaan being a type of salvation. Some folks, I think, believe that Canaan uh, got a conversation one time with a preacher, and he was telling me how Canaan was a type of heaven. But Canaan is, uh, from what I can understand, what I believe about it, Canaan is a type of salvation. It's where I'm living right now. Canaan is where I'm living right now. Egypt, Egypt is in the past. There's always been, a, and God was concerned about it because in the New Testament he mentions about how the route that he took the Israelites through the wilderness because when they saw war he didn't want them to go back to Egypt. There's always been a concern of slipping back into Egypt, but Egypt in the past. Amen. Egypt is in the past. Egypt is my, in my past. Egypt is in your past. It's, it's all past. Through Jesus Christ, it's been put in the past. Amen. I couldn't have put Egypt in the past on my own, but Jesus Christ put Egypt in my past. And so that's where I wanted to stay. The land, whether thou goest in to possess it, it's not like that land. The land of Egypt was a hard land. The land of Egypt wasn't a friendly place to be. It was a hard place to be. They were there because of the decisions that they made in the book of Genesis. And so it, it, they were there for judgment. They were there uh, and they were in a place that was joyous. Amen. And they were there uh, in Egypt is where the journey began. Amen. Every one of our journeys began in Egypt. It all began in a bad place. And I want to tell you something. It was hard. It was hopeless. I felt helpless. And I hated where I was at. Amen. You remember where you were when you right. got saved? You remember how you, how you felt when you got saved? You remember? I think sometimes it's pretty good to remember that. Yeah. I mean, we get discouraged. We get disgruntled with where we are right now. We get thinking, my goodness, this is hard. I've never found it to be as hard as it was back then. Yeah. I've never found it to be that hard. That's right. I was afraid I was going to die over there in Egypt. I got a friend that's going to die. Yes. There in the book of Ruth. They didn't mean to go down. It didn't, doesn't read to me like they meant to go down and stay in Moab. But they stayed longer than they wanted to. And yeah. Had some death happen down there. Right. A lot of death down there. Lots of death. Egypt. And everything that it has and everything that it holds represents hardships and hopelessness. And the place that I'm in today is not like that. Amen. There's so much pulling on our flesh. I don't understand it really. There's so much pulling on our flesh that we, we get down and discouraged and, and we I think we get the feeling like we're almost back in Egypt again. But we're not in Egypt today. Amen. We're not in Egypt. We're not I'm so glad this morning that uh, what I do today is not on my own. I'm not having to carry my own water. Amen. Amen. I'm, not having to, I'm not having to make my own way. God never intended for uh, things to be easy for them in Egypt. There was bondage down there. They were there uh, because of sin. And so there was, there was bondage and things that are not supposed to be easy. I appreciate Brother Ron. I saw uh, uh, something you put on the, uh, there the other day. A quote. I can't remember which one it was. But said if the, uh, uh, said if the prodigal son, if there had been a social gospel uh, in the day of the prodigal son, somebody would have gave him uh, uh, some food and clothes. And he probably never would have went back home. I want to tell you something this morning. I'm glad how that I got tired of the place I was in. Amen. I'm glad. Hey, I get sometimes I get tired of the way things are here right now. Sometimes I get tired of how the things are. But I never have. I never have found it to be like it was back then. Amen. Amen. There's a world full of people around us who are still living in Egypt. True. True. A 
world full of people who don't know anything about the help that we've got. They're still carrying their own water. Can't figure out why things are so hard. God said, uh, if you're going to plant an herb garden down in Egypt, you're going to have to carry your own water. Yeah, that's it. Doing it by the foot. Let's talk about that water wheel that was powered by the foot. Maybe just carrying water by, by buckets. How are you going to do it? It's an unnatural way. However you're going to do it, it's tough. Brother Andy was telling me about planting some planting some trees in the yard and planting them in the middle of the summer and having to carry water. Yeah. Carry buckets of water. He said about wore them out. Yeah. Carry buckets of water. And I didn't say anything to him, but I appreciate the help. I'm going to plant mine when it expecting plenty of rain. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Amen. But see, this place where we live right now, the land of Canaan, where we live right now, you can expect, expect plenty of rain. Yeah. Amen. Do you ever get some dry times here in Canaan? Do you ever get any dry times? Somebody asked me, they said, how's the weather been down home? I said, well, I, I think it's been pretty good. I'm still a mowing my grass every week. Yeah, yeah. I mean, man, we've had some dry times, but the grass is still broke. And I think in Canaan Lane, where we were at, we may have had some dry times, but it, it appears to me that the grass is still growing. I mean, uh, if the grass ain't growing, don't tell none of them folks that was here last night singing, they thought awful happy. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Don't, don't tell Brother Stroud that the grass ain't still growing where we're at right now because he got pretty wound up last night. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We passed by a little church on our way to church and my wife's been noticing. My wife's been noticing a dwindling crowd. I don't know what's going on. But we pass by one week and there's maybe six cars, and a week or two later there's five cars. And, and then granted, we're going before service starts, so I don't know how many is there at the end. But we pass by at the, about the same time this past Sunday morning, and the preacher's car was the only one there. And my heart just about broke for him. But I told her, I said, you know, I ran into one of those members. And he said, you know, there ain't nobody interested in going to church no more. Nobody's interested in going to church anymore. He said, I don't know what's wrong, but he said, we're just going to church and ain't nobody going to church. What he's just saying is that the grass ain't growing anymore. Not getting no rain. Things are drying up and nothing's happening. But I want to tell you something. I, I, you all know me. I'm a country boy. I pastored a little old country church. About 80, 85 people there most of the time. But I'm going to tell you, the grass is green where I'm at. Not because of me, but because of God. I'm going to tell you what makes our grass green. Out of 85 or so people, maybe 90 on a Sunday morning, about 45 of them is going to be below the age of 13. Yeah, amen. I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to tell them children that nobody's interested in church anymore. I don't want to tell them that everybody's going back to Egypt. I don't want to tell them that everybody's abandoned the ship. I don't want to tell them that everybody's living in misery. I don't want to tell them that everything is so bad. Maybe we ought to just throw our hands up and quit. Or maybe we just hold on and stay here just to try to hold on. And hopefully uh, the Lord will come. I'm telling you, I'm looking for the Lord to come. I really am. One of the fellows said at church Sunday morning, he said, uh, he read somewhere where somebody said maybe the Lord would come back by 2030. I said, I'm praying he comes back 20 or 30 minutes. But we got to live like it's going to be 20 or 30 minutes. I want to tell you something, everybody. Uh, they get down and out sometimes, but I'm glad to be living where it rains from heaven. Down in Egypt, there was no rain, and they had to carry all the water. They had to do everything the hard way, but I'm living over here where God's supply is endless. Sure, sure. The land, whether you go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain yes. of heaven. I'm going to be done here just a minute. But let me give you something that David said here in Psalm 65. I appreciate this. Psalm number 65. Look here. At verse number 9. Thou visitest the earth and 
waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God. Which is full of water. Uh, best I can tell, God is not running out. Supplies are not getting short. Things are not about to wind up. Brother Ronnie told me where they're building them uh, Chevrolet trucks. They've got 60,000 of them sitting waiting for a chip to go in. Amen. 60,000 because of supply short. Got, we've got $70,000 trucks sitting in the yard waiting on a 50 cent chip. Yeah. Yeah. What about us? But I'll tell you, Brother Andy, and no supply is short here. Ain't no supply short. I, I'm not waiting on anything. You say, well, you, you never prayed for anything and had to wait on an answer. Oh, sure, but God provided while I was waiting on the answer. Amen. Every day living in Canaan land, every day living in Canaan land, God has supplied everything I've ever needed. I cannot remember one time, Uncle Dole, I can't remember one time needing something God didn't provide. Not been everything I wanted all the time. Maybe didn't get it the way I wanted it. But God provided. Amen. He provides it from heaven. But, so Egypt is in the past. The land is in the present. The water of heaven is the great provision. But I'm looking at verse number 12. The place where we're living this morning is a land which the Lord thy God careth for. I'm glad to be where God cares for me. I've been where God didn't care for. Anybody ever been where God didn't care for? Oh yeah. Outside of His will, I've been where God didn't care for. I was down there in Egypt, and God didn't care for it. But I'm glad He came and got me. Amen. A land. The Lord thy God careful. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it. Amen. There's been times over the last 18 months I've just wondered where God was looking. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm honest with you. I'm not too super spiritual. And I just wondered what was going on. Why, why all these things are happening and how in the world did we get in the place we're in and what's God doing and all that kind of business. But I was reminded when I read this that he's watching everything. And he knows everything. And what's amazing to me is he knows it before it happens. What's amazing to me is he, he gets it from beginning to the end. He already has the whole scene in front of him all at the same time. And I can't hardly understand that. But the eyes of the Lord God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. If I could say anything. To any of us that would maybe give us a little encouragement. He said in verse number 6 of chapter 1, He said, The Lord our God spake unto us concerning Horeb, saying, You've dwelt long enough in this mountain. Turn and take your journey. I don't want to be in the negative. I want to be in the positive. I don't want to be tempted with the things of Egypt. I want to enjoy what I've got right now. And there's a lot of temptations. There's a lot of things that pull us away. But I appreciate what God has given me today. God bless you. Amen. 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 Amen.